crossroads. We're at a crossroads because we're out here in the woods and we love riding our bikes, but on the other hand, we gotta look out for nature locks. People that go like, oh, motorcycles make so much noise and they're like dirty and they mess up the ground and tra -la. So, we gotta figure out a solution. And the best we come, could come up with is a bike that doesn't make the noise, a bike that handles better than your average bike, and a bike that has a lot more fun tech, EA power. Now, in trying to do that, we try to simplify the design as much as we could. Get rid of everything that is unnecessary. And you'd think, on a motorcycle, there are no unnecessary things. So what is more elementary than a motorcycle? I'll tell you what. Do you really need a gearbox? What you do, if you got a, your regular engine, your two-stroke or four-stroke, which has the torque of a, I don't know, of an anteater, but you don't if you have an electric engine, an electric motor, they say. So you might not need a transmission because of maintenance, because of the weight factor, because of ratios that you might not feel really comfortable with. So you might just want to, might want to have a motor in the wheel. Now this puppy right here, this is able to churn out 320 newton meters of torque. 320, that's a lot, okay? That's like, that's like your two liter diesel automobile. That is about 10 times as much as on a regular motorcycle. And I don't think this is gonna just burn up rubber like crazy because on a regular motorcycle like that there, that may only have like 20, 25 newton meters of torque, but it's got the gearbox because it needs that gearbox to multiply the torque. So with its ratios, you get probably around the same figure. You know, you get like 250, 300 meters of torque at the rear wheel, minus losses, friction losses. Well, you don't hear. The motor is in the wheel, meaning no mechanical losses. So what you get at the wheel to be able to transfer, to put down to the ground, is what the motor produces, and that is it. There's no other loss, except for the heat, which is anyway a, a, a lot less than a, a uh, regular engine. We came here, we're just out a few miles from the city, and you, you can probably hear that, that one cracking down as, it, as it's cooling down. Well, here, I can hold my hand on this. It's that efficient, okay? Almost every bit of current that comes from the battery to the motor is transferred into mechanical work. There's no, almost no loss. It's over 90% efficient. Now, you might say, okay, so we got one motor. Um, does, it, does it handle as good? Uh, does, it, does it feel as good as your average bike? Well, to feel even better, we had a, a second motor in a front wheel. Now, normally, this you can switch on and off. I keep it on all the time because you don't like, when you ride on ground like this, when it's level and, and, and dry and everything, you don't really feel it, you know, contributing. Of course, it is contributing, but you don't, you don't feel anything special. But when it gets down to the nitty gritty, when it gets muddy and, and uh, dusty and sandy and everything, then you feel it. Like when you're in a corner leaning in and you, you twist on that throttle, you can feel it get up and go. You can, you can feel it turning in. Uh, besides, when, you're, when you really stick it into a mud pool, um, you, you really feel then the front wheel contributing. You really feel that it's pulling along. When you, like when you, what's really funny, when you climb a steep incline with the front wheel on, uh, then your real wheel stops fishtailing around. You just climb in a straight line because it doesn't have to push all the way to the bike up. This is helping as well and it's pulling the bike so it just stays level, it just stays straight, which is great. Okay, for dri riders like me, okay, I'm not, I'm not your stunt rider, I, I'm just a regular guy. Um, the second reason why we opted for in-wheel, for hub motors, the way they call it, uh, is uh, so we could make the most space available for the battery. Now, battery you see here is 5.2 kilowatt hours. It can store 5.2 kilowatt hours of energy. That is the same that the BMW i8 has. The same capacity, it's not the same battery, but it is the same capacity. And the BMW i8 can pull 35 kilometers on one load, on one charge. 
Uh, this we estimate in, in regular conditions with, you know, having fun driving, we can probably pull like 55, 60, and, and that's, you know, really, really going for it. If you go conservatively, it could be 70, 80. Um, now this, mind you, this is a test bed. It's not a final product, uh, hence all the wires and all the unfinished surfaces. The final test, pro uh, the final test product will have about uh, 10 kilowatt hours, so double that capacity, which can pull you easily 100 kilometers in off-road terrain. Um, it's got a lot of nice stuff, so why don't we finish the intro here and get onto some riding? excited about riding as we were, it turns out we were right about the mud. May not look like much on your TV screen, but from where I'm standing, it's, it's pretty soft and moist. And considering the street tires we have on, it just doesn't make any sense to sleep and struggle. So we're gonna turn around. But check this out. Have you seen this on your regular bike? Reversing on a motorcycle. I'm taking it really easy since it's the first time I'm doing this. Huh? Normally with the regular bike it's push and pull all the way until you can swing it around. But not here. And that's it. And this is how it works. By default, both motors spin forward as they respond to throttle input. Now, you flick a switch and they will run backwards. And there's no other mechanical linkage required. And as soon as you're on the right track, just flick that switch again and you're ready to roll forward. Now. I want to talk to you a little about suspension. You might notice the way we've designed this and we've built it. Uh, this is a HOSAC type suspension. It's what BMW likes to call the dual lever. I call it by its real name, HOSAC. Um, you have a rigid fork and you have two swing arms, also rigid. And the lower one is connected to the frame via the, the shock absorber. They might say, ooh, you know, that is uglier than a dog's bottom. But cats dig it. Let's take a look at your regular telescopic fork for a minute. You already know this picture. What is the other drawback with telescopic forks? They dive on the braking, for one. When you apply the brakes, all the mass transfer from the motorcycle goes up here to the headstock, onto the fork, and down to the wheel. Because that weight transfer needs to be taken over by the ground, needs to be transferred into the ground. And the only way for the suspension to accomplish this is by compressing. Because as soon as you apply pressure from up, upwards, the suspension will compress. When you do that downhill on a bumpy road, the suspension will compress and compress and compress and not have time to rebound and you bottom out. Uh, plus you lose a lot of braking efficiency when you do that. With this, the mass is being transferred naturally via the swing arms. There's no other way. It goes into the fork, onto the wheel. Now these are rigid. They cannot compress. And by adjusting the positioning of the shock absorber, you can dial it in such that actually, even under the hardest of braking, you will not have any dive. Actually, you might even dial the suspension so that you might squat on the braking, but you don't necessarily want to do that. Um, the other thing is that this whole assembly weighs a lot less than your regular suspension, because this is just uh, a few chromoly piping. 
or where you could do it out of aluminum or whatever. Um, and also for us manufacturers, this is important because instead of two long, one meter long shocks, uh, you only have a small, one small one. And all the rest is parts that you can easily manufacture. Um, also, an added bonus is the stiffness, the rigidity of it. Uh, to achieve the same rigidity that you get out of this structure with a telescopic fork, you need 50-60 millimeter piping. And that is one that is expensive, that adds weight, that adds complexity to the whole thing. Translates into cost. And now for the rear suspension, uh, when you have a hub motor, uh, you will, th th this hub motor free wheels on the, on the axle. Meaning, if you accelerate, uh, the, the motor itself will just tend to spin backwards. So you need to take that torque, that spinning torque, and transfer it onto the uh, chassis so that the wheel actually spins forward the way you want it to. So then you have this component right here attached to the motor, and you'd want to transfer the torque back into the frame. Now, it is important that you don't transfer it back into the uh, swing arm because that will create a whole host of unnecessary effects. You want to transfer it back into the frame. And the geometry of this is such that it prevents wheel hop. Like when you brake, uh, especially when you go downhill and you brake or you apply regen, uh, the wheel shouldn't be hopping, shouldn't be uh, leaving the ground. Um, this is what the BMW calls uh, power lever. It's two levers, not not really parallel, but pretty much close to that. Black hole, the black hole in you. It's the black hole. 